Welcome to E3 Rehab. I'm Dr. Mark Sertica, physical therapist. Today, I'm gonna to discuss the anatomy and function of the gluteus medius, demonstrate non-weight-bearing and weight-bearing exercises and progressions, and provide the rationale for the exercise selection, including any limitations. The gluteus medius is a fan-shaped muscle that attaches from the lateral aspect of the pelvis to the greater trochanter of the femur and is comprised of three distinct parts, anterior, middle, and posterior. The gluteus medius, along with the tensor fascia lata and gluteus minimus, is innervated by the superior gluteal nerve. All three aspects of this muscle act to abduct the hip, and of the primary hip abductors, the glute med accounts for about 60% of the total cross-sectional area. Additionally, the anterior portion serves as a secondary hip flexor and internal rotator, whereas the posterior portion acts as a hip extensor and external rotator. With the hip flexed to 90 degrees, all compartments contribute to hip internal rotation. The glute med is also well known for its role in frontal plane stability during gait or single limb stance. Let's reference a seesaw or teeter-totter. Imagine the femoral head as the fulcrum and body weight sitting on one side of that seesaw, tipping the pelvis downward. On the other side, the hip abductors are pulling down on the pelvis to counteract the forces due to body weight to help maintain that frontal plane stability. As I discuss the exercises, make sure to keep the anatomy and function in mind. The most well-known non-weight-bearing exercise for the gluteus medius is sideline hip abduction. Although it's relatively easy to set up and execute, there are a few cues that might help you maximize its effectiveness. Start on your side with the bottom hip and knee bent to increase your base of support. Your top leg is the working leg. Your ankle should be in line with your shoulder so that your knee and hip are straight, or the ankle can be behind you to pre-position the hip into extension. To increase the activation of the gluteus medius, the hip should be slightly internally rotated. To make sure that your pelvis doesn't rotate back, you can either put an object behind you to serve as a tactile cue or perform the exercise against a wall. The wall has the added benefit of allowing you to slide your heel along it to maintain the sagittal plane position of the hip in neutral or extension. There are a few ways to progress the movement. You can add an ankle weight to the knee and then transition to the ankle as you get stronger. You can hold a weight at the knee or you can place a band around your knees. I'll give specific set and rep recommendations toward the end of the video. Another similar weight bearing progression is the side plank, which has been shown to elicit high activation of the gluteus medius. To make this even harder, you can do a side plank with hip abduction, which further challenges the bottom leg. If you're really strong, add a weight around the ankle or band around the knees again. Simple regressions include the short side plank and short side plank with hip abduction with or without added resistance. For any of these side plank variations, keep the hips elevated and maintain a straight line from your shoulders to your ankles. If you'd rather transition to standing exercises, the most common movement is probably some variation of a banded sidestep. Few things to keep in mind. Perform the exercise in a squat position if possible. Keep your feet facing forward the entire time so they don't externally rotate. Don't just focus on the moving limb because the stance limb hip abductors are actually working harder. Now, research does show that band position influences the degree of glute med activation with a band around the feet being the most effective. However, I don't solely base my recommendation on that data. Instead, I'm interested in the technique. Are you able to perform the exercise without a lateral trunk lean? Are you leading with your knees so that you aren't moving into internal rotation of the hip? Are you keeping your feet facing forward? And is your head staying at relatively the same height so you're not bobbing up and down? 
I also want to know where you're feeling the exercise. If a band around the knees allows you to maintain all of those technical cues and you're feeling a burn in the glutes, I'd rather just increase the resistance of the band over time before moving it to the ankle or feet in most cases. The last group of exercises includes anything that emphasizes single limb stance as they have been shown to elicit high activation of the glute med, such as a single leg squat or single leg deadlift. Even something like a reverse lunge with a weight in the opposite hand may be a viable option. The possibilities are endless here. A few unique exercises, single limb stance with a weight in the opposite hand while squeezing the glutes, keeping the pelvis level, and having the opposite hip flexed, marching in place with a weight hanging from a belt, or a physical therapy favorite, the Captain Morgan, in which you're standing on one leg with the opposite hip flexed while pushing into the wall with that leg and maintaining stability. The stance leg is working here. So why try to isolate the gluteus medius? Shouldn't we be focusing on movements rather than muscles? For the most part, yes, I agree with that line of thinking. However, sometimes specific movements are required to maximize the adaptations at specific muscles. For example, I did a video about reverse Nordics talking about how squats and lunges don't train the rectus femoris very well because they incorporate simultaneous knee and hip extension. If you want to potentially reduce the risk of rectus femoris injuries or rehabilitate a rectus femoris injury, something like a reverse Nordic is probably a good idea. So there are four reasons why you might want to incorporate these types of exercises into your routine. One, aesthetics. If you want the most well-developed glutes possible. Two, rehab. For certain conditions like gluteal tendinopathy, individuals demonstrate hip abductor weakness. And since they might unknowingly offload that region secondary to pain or weakness, targeted loading can be very beneficial. The last two reasons are injury risk reduction and performance, which the evidence isn't too strong for, but an argument can be made. As promised, here's my summary and practical recommendations with sets and reps. If you train legs at least twice per week, which is ideal, you can incorporate one unilateral hinge or squat slash lunge exercise per session. For example, day one could be back squats and single leg deadlifts, while day two could be conventional deadlifts and reverse lunges. Now, you're gonna to have to take the rest of your programming into consideration, but three to five sets of eight to 12 reps is a good starting point. For the hip abduction specific exercises, you could do them one to three times per week for three to four sets of 10 to 20 repetitions or 30 to 60 second holds. Isometrics can be a great choice because the hip abductors produce the most torque near that neutral hip position which coincidentally is where they most often function. The main limitation with a lot of the research that was presented is that it's based on EMG data. However, these exercises are still built on a solid foundation of anatomy and biomechanics. All right, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please smash that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications, and leave any questions or comments down below. Peace.